and hello and welcome in to Views from the Sidelines. I'm your host, Joey Tysick, my partner, Malik Hill. We're going to ignore the fact that he's wearing something from the state below. Um, but it's August 11th. Got a lot to talk about. We got some NBA Summer League It's all games. about the person on the, on the jersey, okay? It has nothing to do with the team. And how he's no longer in the NFL. And I will support him till the end. <laughs> Anyway, apparently that's the only <laughs> set of NFL apparel that Malik knows. Tragic, has. but also hilarious. Today we're going to talk about who the real number one pick of the draft was uh, last night. Cade Cunningham, Jalen Green faced off. Got some of that. Um, there's a big free agent signing that was left to be had. Boston Celtics got the, to big, reap the rewards of quote that. Unquote. And then we're going to yeah. start doing our college and NFL previews. Today we're going to start for college. We're going to do the SEC, get the big one out of the way. We'll wait to do the Big Ten till the last, just before college football games start. And the NFL, we are going with the AFC North because it's a highly contested division. And Malik decided, why not, since he's wearing the gear. So that's what we got on the table. So right away, NBA Summer League in full swing. We all know I'm not the biggest NBA Summer league guy. I'm not a preseason guy for the NFL. Every year I have to I have to give you the reasoning of why it matters in the grand scheme of things. Should should I have to tell the people? I, I mean, I guess if you want, but I, <laughs> it's not going to matter to me. I'm telling you. It's not going to change my it, opinion. It's not the most important thing in the world, obviously. You know that as you barely watch it and barely pay attention to it. Mm-hmm. But... I think the key things when it comes to the summer league is, first of all, the second year players, they got to dominate. Yeah, it's it's very important. I do agree with that. It's very important that second year players come in, are the leaders of the teams, and they m- make it clear that they've improved, and that there's no doubt that they're the future of their franchise, and that's what most second year players are doing now. Desmond Bain from Memphis balling, Peyton Pritchard playing great point guard. Maybe the best point guard in the summer league right now. He had like 21, 12, and 9 yesterday for them. Mm-hmm. Aaron Neesmith had 33 for the Celtics yesterday. Yeah. Celtics fans are like scared yeah. of, of how productive they are right now. Right. Because it, it could be great, but it all co- also could be a, a, a fluke. Bull Bull looking more and more like Kevin Durant every day. Everybody's on the Bull Bull train. But <laughs> I mean, we were on just, it. People just want to see it. We were on it last year. We wanted them to play more last year, but. Yeah, but the, the key. Main thing, second-year players need to dominate. I remember a few years ago, Devin Booker's second year, their very first game, Phoenix Suns, he scores like 25 points in the first quarter, and they sit him and didn't play him for the rest of the summer league. That's like the most dominant second-year player I saw. But, Mm -hmm. yeah, that's the biggest key. And then secondly, for the rookies, it's to get acclimated with a few of of the guys that are going to be your teammates. Start to get the kinks out even before preseason, just to start to figure out like your style of play in the NBA and to show the signs of what you can be as an NBA player. Like to me, the stats don't matter. I didn't care about Cade going out there. I mean, if he had 30 on 25 shots or 30 on like 10 shots, I wouldn't have cared that much. Seeing him play the right way and play within his game is what is most important. And those are really the two biggest things. Second year players go out there, control the game and dominate and rookies show the promise, show why you got picked. Mm-hmm. And and I think those things are important. And I think that's why summer league has some importance. Yeah. And I'm not saying that it has no importance, but when you get people watching and making all of these crazy assumptions, it's like, well, we talk, much. it's that's like we've talked yes. about with like NFL training camps or scouting combines, all that Zach Wilson talk that we had been talking about. And now you get into training camp, Zach Wilson's not doing as much. But they're still hyping him up. That's that's just kind of my point is, like, Summer League is great to kind of see these young guys first first time playing in the NBA, per se. But my biggest thing is, like, it's not the NBA. The Summer League, like, (laughs) I brought it up earlier in the week uh, in our little group chat that uh, Portland is playing Kenneth Fareed, Michael Beasley, and and Emmanuel Emmanuel Moutier. Listen, that that's not supposed to be a summer league team. I know, I know. I, I don't know. It, there are certain teams like the Dallas Mavericks have had the worst summer league team as long as I've been watching. Yeah, they do. They don't play rookies 
they just bring random dudes from overseas and like G League players that have been around for like seven years. Right. And they just put them together and they're terrible. Those are the type of teams that I don't watch in Summer League because there's no point. Yeah. None at all. And that's what I say too. And um, one of the big things too is like, look at some of the past Summer League All Stars for the Pistons. And the Pistons should have won a championship by now. Stanley Johnson was incredible in Summer League. He had a good rookie season. He, and then he had a decent rookie season. Yeah, things went off the rails. Yeah, he did. He did Hen- look phenomenal. Henry Ellenson is known for summer league stats. I don't remember him being that impressive in the he summer league. He did it like league. two. Really he, he did it like two years in a row. That's what I also said to you. Every rookie I remember balling out in the summer league never goes into the NBA and just falls apart. I've never seen it happen. It usually transfers. I remember Donovan Mitchell and Jason Tatum played each other in their first like summer league game in Utah, mm-hmm. and the entire game the crowd was going nuts because them two clearly had superstar talent and they were like head and shoulders above everybody else on their teams. Yeah. Like they're, they're pl- players like those where it's clear that the talent is going to translate. Right. Now, of course they're, they're second and third year guys that have like 20, 30 point games. Like, uh, Antonio Blakeney had 27, his first game for the Blazers. Yeah. He's been out of the NBA for like a year. Right. Doesn't really matter if they sign him. Cool. If they don't, it is what it is. Mm-hmm. Those are the, those type of things that don't matter. It's the rookies and the second year guys that are most important. Yeah, I don't know. It's just kind of my my little thoughts. Yeah, there there are there are those those certain players every now and then that have really good summer leagues and then can't translate it. Like I remember when Furkan Korkmaz had forty in a summer league game, and Philly fans were going crazy. Now he just got a contract extension. Because yeah. after that summer league, he did improve as a shooter, and he's been consistent ever since. Mm-hmm. But that 40-point game, it, it wasn't like a sign of things to come for Furkan Korkmaz. Right. It was just a, a fact of he improved. He showed what he needed to show. He's done in the summer league. Right. It's the things like that. Yeah. I just don't want people to take too much craziness away. Oh, yeah. But people have way too much analysis. I remember Trey Young – couldn't hit a three his first two summer league games, mm-hmm. and everybody called him a bust. Yeah. Like, he, he was awful. Right. Next two games was pretty good, and now we see where he is. Yeah. Well, let's get right into it with the Pistons. Like, their first game of the summer league, Cade Cunningham hit his first two threes. Yeah, he did. And then he kind of struggled a bit. He had some turnovers. Turnovers necessarily weren't his fault. Yeah. Um, But right away, and Jalen Green had a really good first uh, debut. Jalen Green came out – Came out aggressive. So people immediately were saying, oh, this is why we should have taken Jalen Green with number one or Cade's a bust. And yeah. it's like, come on. Can you just think for a second? And and that's that's kind of my problem with Summer League stuff. Um, but, and the other thing is, too, like Jalen Green played in the G League last year. People are, like, yeah. forgetting this guy came from the G League. He has pseudo-NBA experience but- already. It was the first year of the G League Elite, so nobody – I watched that game, Jalen Green's game specifically, mm-hmm. to see what his game would be like because he's one, He's in in the first group of the G League kids. Yeah. And, yes, it's clearly showing that some of that NBA, like, training right. and guidance has rubbed off on well, him because he's, he's, he's playing like a veteran player. And that's what I mean. Like, the jump from that – from college to that is a big jump already. Like, people – People don't hardly ever realize how crazy it is of the talent difference um, just getting into G League stuff. So he should be, honestly, in my opinion, Jalen Green should be better right now than Cade Cunningham. And right now he, he pretty much is. Just it's overall as a as standpoint. A, as a score, yeah. Yeah, and I'm, he just looks better at the moment. Um, but last night was the big game. Jalen Green playing against Cade Cunningham in their first – First meeting of their career, the number one and two picks, and both played pretty well. Yeah, Cade started off hot again, slowed down a little, finished eight of eighteen from the field, four of nine from the three, finished with twenty points. Uh, he was really comfortable. Four turnovers, a block, three steals, two assists, four yeah. rebounds, just a little bit of everything. Um, and yeah, I, I think he looks comfortable. He doesn't look rushed. Um. He just looks like he's he's just trying to find his fitting in the team. And the team, 
they've looked shaky a lot worse than we thought they would. They they have like four or five truly high level talented players, mm-hmm. and the rest of the team is just roster spots for the most part. Yeah, and that's mostly just because, for the most part, the Pistons roster is pretty constructed for the season. Um, so they don't have to work out a whole yeah. lot of things. It was clear Sadiq Bay was like the pro of the team. Yeah. Like he he was smooth. He he made some post moves that looked really – he's improving on the offensive end. He's really confident, and the defense is still there. Yeah. So it was clear Sadiq was like the one true pro out of everybody. But Cade, he came out and made a little statement in the beginning. He, he was checking up Jalen Green, got a steal off of him, bullied him at the rim and got an assist like mm-hmm. – he came out aggressive and then settled into himself. Like that first game, he was just feeling things out. Like you said, first summer league game is when you start. First two games is really when you get the kinks out and you just start feeling out your game. But since he's so talented, it didn't take him long to just figure it out and, and get clicked right in. Mm-hmm. Uh, before we go into a little more depth of the Pistons, I kind of want to talk about. Um, I also just want to mention the Rockets have just one of the better summer league teams out there. Yeah. Um, their, their three picks from this draft have worked out really well. Alfred Sagoon, Jalen Green, Josh Christopher. Josh Christopher has looked really comfortable. Um, and then they have Kenyon Martin Jr. who played last year in the exactly. season and put up really good numbers. Kyrie Thomas, who's, you know, former Pisson. Seeing him was, it was kind of weird. Yeah. yeah. So he's had his, his time. They have Jay Sean Tate on the team. He didn't really play, but. You know, he played in the NBA last year, so they're just a solid summer league roster right now um, with some experience already. Um, and, yeah, they I mean, they just they just look good. Um, but now the Pistons, I will say the bright spots that I'm happy about, um, besides just watching Cade develop and, you know, Sadiq kind of doing what he did last year, I got to talk about Luka Garza and Saban Lee. Um, We already know I'm a big fan of Saban Lee of what he did last year. Um, I like that he made it back to the roster this season, got signed to a three-year deal. I just like his – you talk about comfort level for Cade Cunningham. That's exactly what Saban Lee did last year. And kind of out of nowhere, I was – I remember late in the draft last year, I wanted the Pistons to take Cassius Stanley really bad, and I thought that would have been a late-round steal. It hasn't really worked out for the Pacers. Saban Lee was the pick. I didn't really know much about him. I learned a little bit after you talked about it. And I was like, okay, I can see it. But as soon as he stepped on the floor, he he was ready to go. He's and, high energy. Yeah. And that's exactly what I like for this team. Um, so he's had a good summer league yeah. so for, far. For his size, he plays bigger than his size. Yeah. Because when he drives to the rim, it seems like his shots should be blocked. Yeah. He always figures out a way to get a shot up or get fouled. I was going to say, I, I like the way he attacks. He just goes yeah. right at it. He has a lot of bounce, so he's not afraid to go at people. Right, and that's that's what we need out of him. Um, and then Luca Garza. I know there's a lot of, like, will he make it transition to the NBA? He did lose 25 pounds, so he's slimmed up. That doesn't help a lot. He's still just not athletic. <laughs> I mean, it, But it helps. It, it's, it's, it looks better right now to yeah. me because – he, it's not a struggle for him to get up and down the floor. Right. He's still not very fast. Yeah. But if a turnover happens and then somebody scores and he has to get back down, yes, he's not extremely behind. He'll, he'll still be a little behind. Right. But he's not dragging like he was at Iowa mm-hmm. just to get back on defense to score. Yeah. But at the same time, that was never what we really thought of him. What we did yeah. think is that if his if he can figure out how to put the ball in the bucket like he did in college – He's going to be serviceable. And so far, he's been incredible, I would say, just be, just due to efficiency. In the, in the, in the role he has, he's right. been really, really yes. quality. It's I mean, it's only two games, small sample size, but he's just been super efficient from the floor, getting his shots, spreading the floor. And he's been, he's been active on the rebounds, too, which is nice. I mean, yeah. he's a big body still, so you need him to do that. But he had 15 in this game in 16 minutes, five of six from the floor, one of two from the three, got to the free throw line. Four or four from the free throw line, that's really good for a big guy. I mean, he's known for having a good shot. But just knowing that the Pistons have that as an option, I think is really good. So to have the the Pistons bench has kind of been not necessarily the biggest question mark because they've 
you know, they got Josh Jackson, Diallo. There's potential there, but I don't know. I just like seeing their bench getting deeper or possibly getting deeper. So for me, that's that's a big thing. Um, we did see Balsa Kopervica in this game. Not not much. No, yeah. I mean four minutes, but I'm hoping that they'll maybe slowly increase his minutes as the summer league goes on because I'm I am honestly curious of what he's going to look like. And honestly, of course, what they're going to do with him, we most likely think he'll be G League or something, but it at least gives us a little indication. Again, don't take too much from Summer League, but I'm intrigued to see what he can do. Um, now let's flip to the other side of, well, do you have anybody else of like highlighting that's played well? Because now I'm going to go into disappointments if you don't. Yeah, uh, there are a few guys. So I think the very first game the Raptors played, I can't remember who they played, but Scotty Barnes played, and he he pretty much showed why he was the number four pick. All the potential that everybody has seen, which is basically like a souped-up Draymond, mm-hmm. he showed it. His His feel for the game, he's not the quickest with the ball, but he makes good decisions. It, he doesn't get stripped much because of his long wingspan. He took a few three. I'm co- I'm happy he was confident taking threes. He only took like four. He hit one, but the one he hit in transition looked very smooth. His mechanics aren't bad. He just has to keep working on it. He got some post touches that look good too. He just he has a lot of good things to build off of when it comes to offense because mm-hmm. he has almost everything else, yeah. and that's the big positive thing with him. Uh, other than that, Josh Giddy he got hurt in that first game, so yeah. he had that one open dunk, and then. That's that's the type of stuff where I'm like you, where people got very excited from that one open dunk, and I was like, okay, come on, yeah, like let's let's chill out. Right. Chris, Chris Duarte for the Pacers. His role won't be having the ball in his hands and being like a go-to scorer, but when he has the ball in his hands, it mm-hmm. takes him. He he's not a guy that comes out and gets hot immediately, but once he gets going, he can hit from deep and he can hit often. He's yeah. a really good shot maker. Mm-hmm. And then Moses Moody and Jonathan Kuminga. It looks like Golden State might have made the right decisions. Yep. Just going with pure talent. Like, Kuminga, he he has so much raw physical talent. Mm-hmm. He just, just like, goes through people and just gets to the rack and finishes so easy. Yeah. And Moses Moody's just a shot maker. Mm-hmm. Like we talked about. I'd, I was surprised teams in the top ten didn't consider him more. He can help the Warriors right now. And, yeah. And then my guy, Alperin Shingun, best European overseas prospect in this draft the person I'm most impressed with Trey Murphy from Virginia for the Pelicans he had 27 in their first game yeah again his, small his, sample size but, but his but... his stroke is so effortless yeah like whether it was in transition coming around screens like coming out of plays when he gets it it's, it's like a slingshot off the shoulder yeah and it's just high arcing and it just like swishes through he went six of eight from three he dunked on somebody in the paint off the vert. Like, he has size, he has length, he can defend, and he can shoot it. Mm-hmm. And even Herb Jones looked good. So the Pelicans made some really good picks. But, yeah, Trey Murphy, I didn't expect him to go off like he did in that first game. He he looked really comfortable. Yeah. Um, my final one that I'll point out to you is the, uh, which I thought probably would happen, is the Hawks picks. They got Jalen Johnson as kind of a, kind of a steal for as good of a team as they are um, because there's a lot of question marks for him. And then Sharif Cooper getting him in the second round. I'm still, I'm still so up and down with Sharif Cooper because he has so much talent, but there are times where he's just so lackadaisical with the ball and he just like, doesn't he, it's like the athleticism for his size. That first game, Peyton Pritchard had him locked up. Yeah. Like he, he couldn't get past him. And he was trying those hesitation straight line drives, and it wasn't working. But the second game, five of eight from three, mm-hmm. he looked a lot more comfortable. His passing is top notch. He has such great court vision, and he hit the game winning three, twenty one points. Yep. He clearly has the talent, but he still has a lot to work on. Yeah. Yeah. All right. Final thing about the summer league I want to talk about real quick is the Pistons' disappointments. Killian Hayes. And Sekou Dumboya. Killian scares me. I think he can be good for this team. 
in pick and roll the, situations. The jumper is the part that scares me because when exactly when he gets past somebody and gets into the paint, he scores very easily. Yeah. Well, but uh, it's every other thing about scoring that's tough for him. Yeah, and I think it was was Doris Burke announcing that game last night. I think so. I, I she was one to point out quickly that there was a tough shot that Jalen Green got over Cade Cunningham that he, he just didn't think about it, pulled it. Killian had a wide open three just before that. Pump fake passed it, it, passed up. it up. Yeah. That's what's scary is like, I don't know if it's a confidence thing or what. And we already knew that Killian might struggle with his shot, but it's nerve wracking that now it just might never happen. I still think he can improve. Him shooting over 80% from the free throw line shows he can improve the jumper. Mm-hmm. It's just, can he? Yeah, and he he has to keep working at it, but yeah, it's it, it's it's kind of yeah iffy. Yeah, very iffy. So still a really good passer, still a good defender, still a pretty good IQ for his age, but yeah, he's still a project. Right. Luckily for this team, now that we have Cade, there will be pressure off of him. Now so Seku, Seku's in his third <laughs> year. Uh, yeah, his third year now. Third year summer league. And this, now yeah. I, I said it before that. You know, at the time when we drafted him, I think we drafted him like 15th overall. It was a supposed steal because he was top 10 for the longest time and he dropped out of there. So it just seemed like that was the best option um, to take him there. That was also the in-between year of Stan Van Gundy and Troy Weaver. Ed Stefanski made that pick. I'm not super mad about it, but he is just not. He is not really produced. He still looks raw. Every time he shoots a jumper, it looks off. Yeah. Even if it like even if it bounces off the back of the rim or something, mm-hmm. it it just looks off, and it it doesn't look confident. He had one good drive to the rim yesterday where he went body to body and like went over and finished. But outside of those moves where he's trying to muscle somebody to the rim, it's it's just not there. Yeah. Like out, outside of being a defensive stopper, I I don't know what else he really has in terms of what his game could be. Yeah. So it's, I mean, it stinks because you wanted him to see what, uh, do well thought because being that raw, that there's a chance that he could do something, but right now it's not looking like it. So, I mean, it's another one of those. We'll have to wait and see, but right now it's not looking great. He might be on the trading block. I still have hope for Killian because he has more, he has more tools. Yeah, and, and, and more actual basketball talent than right, and he's just yeah. going into his second season. Exactly, so we'll have to see. All right, that's enough summer league talk. Maybe we'll talk about a little bit more, at least Pistons wise. Uh, maybe a couple highlights here and there of different teams. But I wanted to get into college football. Now I haven't done any research in college football because I've been full swing NFL. We just announced. I just got into a fantasy league, so I'm obsessing over the NFL right now. So I'm going to let Malik kind of take over. I'll input if I can, but we're going to talk about the SEC right now and uh, potential of new teams joining the SEC as well. So the Southeastern Conference, as usual last year, Alabama won the conference. They, They got a tough matchup from Florida and Kyle Trask and Kyle Pitts and all those elite weapons they had. I think it was like 49-42. It was a really like high scoring game, but yeah, last year Alabama ended up winning it. It was a shortened season. A lot of people didn't pay much attention to last season cuz there was no atmosphere. Some some schools brought in band. Schools in the SEC gradually brought in more fans and the more of the atmosphere as the year went on. But still it was outside of the SEC not much atmosphere, so Right. Yeah, not many people paid attention. So when it comes to the SEC, there are a few teams going through changes. Tennessee has had a very, very underwhelming, disappointing, really just bad stretch of years, like the past two or three years. Mm-hmm. They fired They fired their coach, Jeremy Pruitt. There were allegations of paying players. There was no offensive improvement like seen anywhere. So they fired him. And they bring in Josh Heupel from UCF, who after Scott Frost left for Nebraska, he's been the coach at UCF for the past two seasons, three seasons actually. And they've kind of like evened off. They didn't get much better under Josh Heupel, but the offense 
stayed at a high level, stayed very explosive. Dylan Gabriel, who's one of the best quarterbacks in the country, grew under Josh Heupel. He was a Josh Heupel recruit. So, brand new coach, brand new system. A lot of recruits that they brought in, they had a top 10 recruiting class. Half the class left once Jeremy Pruitt got fired. They got a lot of stuff they're trying to figure out. They have four brand new, well, three brand new quarterbacks on their roster. One of them is Josh Milton, who was at Michigan last season. He transferred from Michigan, went to Tennessee. They also have a few other quarterbacks coming back. They have Hendon Hooker from Virginia Tech. They're pretty much rebuilding at this point. So they have a coach that could bring in a high flying offense, a lot of points. Hopefully that's what Tennessee is hoping for because they won't be good for a long time. He might not be there for a long time. Yeah, Tennessee, it just hasn't been good looks for them for a while. So I, I hope things can get – I hope their offense is at least exciting mm-hmm. with Josh Heupel in there because there, there have been some dark days. They lost to Georgia State two years ago. Like, it's, it's just been off for Tennessee. I hope they can get things together. South Carolina also hired a brand-new coach. They brought in Shane Beamer, who has not much coaching experience in college football, but he has one of the best reputations in college football – as a guy that just knows the sport and is just like a great person overall. Mm -hmm. Like he, he was in the running for a lot of jobs just off of his reputation base. And that's one, honestly, it's up in the air right now. They, they're figuring out what players they're going to play. Guys have left. Some transfers have come in. They got some interesting freshmen, but another rebuilding project in South Carolina I want to talk about a few of the winning teams <laughs> <laughs> just to get away from the bottom feeders. Okay. Nick Saban, how do you feel about Alabama and Nick Saban? Hate them. After they've won six of the last 12 national championships, Joey. How do you feel about that? Hate it. <laughs> College football getting stale. Listen, Mac Jones out. Najee Harris out. Devontae Smith out. Jalen Waddle out. Jalen Waddle out. How do you, you think they got some players to just, just go back right into it? You think? Yes. Yes, they do. They definitely do. I know they do. It doesn't matter. <laughs> they absolutely do. Oh, they got this guy, uh, Bryce Young or something yes. like that? A guy that I honestly, it, yeah, hyping it up like this is, is too much. I understand. Mm-hmm. But as long as I've watched him, especially since high school, there's a reason why, besides Trevor Lawrence, he's one of the most highly ranked quarterbacks in like the past 15, 20 years. Mm-hmm. He was polished walking into Alabama, previously committed to USC. He's from California, decommitted from USC and decided to go to Alabama. And he's polished. He has the IQ. He has the arm strength. He has the accuracy. He can run too, which is why I compare him to a young Russell Wilson. Mm -hmm. He has so much talent and he's only like six foot or six one. Like 190 something pounds. Six foot 194 is what they he's, have him listed. He's not very big. When you see him up close, he doesn't look very intimidating or like a high level college football player. He hasn't even played a game yet. Mm-hmm. Nick Saban has mentioned with these new NIL rules with player being able to, players being able to take sponsorships and stuff, he almost has like well over a million dollars in sponsorships because he people are expecting this kid to be a Heisman candidate. Yeah. He has been hyped up for the past two years. Everybody knows how good he is. He's the unquestioned starter, and I expect him to light it up. Mm-hmm. I mean, Alabama's going to just come back again. They don't, like, start over. They just reload. Yep. And they have some freshman and sophomore receivers that have to play more, but they still have veteran guys like John Mechie, mm-hmm. who played last year, Slade Bolden as a, a slot receiver option. And they're loaded on defense. (laughs) Yep. Something people haven't noticed is the past two years, they've kind of dipped on defense because of injuries and youth. Yeah. They're healthy and they're experienced again. Mm -hmm. So now they have the offense and the defense. They might win it again. And you might not be happy about it. I won't be. But but they're going to put on several shows this year. Mm -hmm. Alabama's back. I won't make a prediction on them yet, but they're obviously 1-2 in the country. Yeah. There's not much you can say mm-hmm. outside of them. Now, after them, I will predict this. 
I think Georgia's going to be the second best team in the conference, and I think they could finally beat Alabama in the SEC championship. And mm-hmm. that is because they finally, for the first time since Matthew Stafford, that was 2008, man. For the first time in over 10 years, mm-hmm. they have a guy that is one of the best in the country. JT Daniels. JT Daniels. He has the NFL hype. He has Heisman hype. And SEC media, the Georgia fans, and his team are excited and they believe in him. And he's got the mustache. He's got that stash. It looks kind of off. It definitely looks But off. listen, he makes it work with his play on the field. This is a guy, another guy from California, went to USC first. Mm-hmm. Started his freshman season, had ups and downs. Went into a sophomore season as a starter, tore his ACL, and lost his job. To another guy, Keaton Slovis, who when we get to the Pac-12, another guy who's an NFL, on NFL radars, but left USC, came to Georgia, had to recover from his injury. They went through several options at quarterback. And he finally got his chance, and as soon as he got the job, started lighting it up on the scoreboards. He only got like a four-game sample size, four or five games. But he showed what Georgia fans haven't seen since, I, honestly, actually since Jacob Beeson, the guy who's going to start this season for Indianapolis. When he was a freshman at Georgia, he had this much talent. He was 6'6", 240, with an unbelievable arm. He gets hurt, loses his job to Jake Fromm. The rest is history. JT Daniels has the talent. He has the talent around him. The defense is stacked. Georgia has been recruiting on the level of, of Alabama for the past four or five years now. The only difference is Alabama has Nick Saban and Georgia has Kirby Smart. Kirby has only been coaching as a head coach for five years now. He got Georgia to the national championship with Jake Prom as a freshman, and they lost to Nick Saban. Brought in JT, Justin Fields. We all know that controversy. He picked Jake Fromm over Justin Fields. Mm-hmm. And Justin went to Ohio State and became a phenom. Yes. What everybody thought. And Georgia fans are mad about that to this day. So the fact that they have a guy now that they they might just have him for a year. But this is the window for Georgia. Mm -hmm. Maybe for the next like three, four years. This is the year to beat Bama. Because after JT Daniels, there's a bunch of freshmen and sophomores with no experience and just talent. This has to be the year. They got Zamir White coming back, uh, all SEC caliber running back, several high level receivers with a bunch of talent. You got a tight end that just came from LSU that was a top tight end in the country that, that was a freshman at LSU last year. He transferred into Georgia. They're talking about playing him at some receiver too. He's like 6'6, 230, Kyle Pitts type. And we're going to start saying that now mm-hmm. for like the next 10 years. Georgia has everything that it takes. But it's going to be, can Kirby outcoach Nick Saban? Yeah. Nick is Nick. <laughs> Kirby has taken L several times to him. This has to, this has to be the year, honestly. Things get very sketchy for Georgia if they don't win it this year. A lot of question marks. A few teams after that, Florida and Texas A&M, they finished high in the SEC last year. Florida, I brought up already, they lost most of their talent. But they have a guy in Emory Jones at quarterback who's been there for four years now. He's waited his turn. Finally. Yeah. Guy that was committed to Ohio State, decommitted, went to Florida. And if Dan Mullen plays this right, he could have a more, more of a run it back team than a rebuild because every quarterback he had at Mississippi State was a running threat before a passing threat. Dak Prescott eventually became a passing threat, Booney like his last year at Mississippi State. But his first two years, it was run and then pass. And it fought, that followed for every other Mississippi State quarterback. He comes to Florida, gets Felipe Franks, doesn't really work out, Kyle Trask, air raid. Now he's back to a guy that's more run than pass, but has high-level ability in both. How he plays it with that is going to be very interesting to see. They have a running back that just transferred in from Clemson, Demarcus Bowman. He was a five-star kid. Went to Clemson, went through spring camp, spring camp, and then just left. It's becoming a theme for a lot of these freshmen, which isn't very good for college football. Transfer portal going crazy, but it is what it is. 
now that the one the one transfer rule, you can Im- immediately go somewhere and play. Kids are doing that all the time now. But yeah, they have him. They have a few more running backs. They have some talented receivers. Pretty stacked, it's pretty stacked defense. They, alongside with LSU, they've been known as DBU for like the past like ten years because they always produce NFL level corners and safeties. They still have that, but they're younger guys. So Florida, they're they're more interesting. I don't think they'll be as good as Georgia, but Florida will be around there. They might be more of an eight nine win team, but if Emory Jones can hit that potential, they could be a ten win team. And potentially upset Georgia because that rivalry, Florida and Georgia, they beat each other every, like every other year, they upset each other. One team is highly ranked, they lose. It, it goes back and forth. Although Georgia should be better, who knows what could happen? Texas A and M, Jimbo Fisher. Last year they lose one game, get all the way to the Orange Bowl, beat North Carolina. Now they have a new quarterback. They're kind of running it back at most other positions. But they're bringing in a guy that's a freshman. Most likely Haynes King. It's between Haynes King and a guy named Zach Calzada, who's a sophomore. But a lot of people think it'll be Haynes King because he can run as well as pass just as well. So coming off a 10-win season, one loss to Alabama, which they they kind of got their butts whooped. The question is how how much can they improve with a brand new young quarterback? and some veteran pieces around them. I think they're around a 9 or 10 win team, but they're in the same division as Alabama. And with a brand new quarterback going against Alabama, I don't see it likely them winning that division. So I can see them finishing second in the West. Next up, Ole Miss, Lane Kiffin. Huge excitement in Mississippi. Lane Kiffin leaves Alabama, jumps to Ole Miss, they have a circus act of an offense. Mm-hmm. They put up almost 50 on Alabama. I think it was 49. The game was like 63-49, college basketball score. Yeah, They had them on the ropes for a lot of the game. They also have a quarterback that could potentially be on the NFL radars and Matt Corral. I don't think he's going to be a first-round guy, but he could be second or third round. They're more in a not technically rebuilding because they have a lot of talent, but I don't think they're up there to contend in the conference yet. They could be a surprise and win eight or nine games, but they have enough talent to be like third or fourth in the in the division. So I could see that. Next up in the East, Kentucky. They've been pretty vanilla over the past few years, but they're trying to switch up on offense. They don't know who they're going to start at quarterback. They got some young, talented receivers. They got some tough running backs, and they always have a stout defense. Kentucky is always good for at least six or seven wins. That's most likely what they're going to get again. Same Kentucky. Good, tough team. I said South Carolina already. Yep. Auburn, brand new coach. Gus Malzahn is out. Brian Harson from Boise State is in. Nobody has any idea how this is going to work out. Mm-hmm. Everybody assumed they go for another SEC option or far higher one of the uh, assistants they had that had been there for a long time under Gus Malzahn. But they went with a guy from Boise, Idaho. Not much connection to the South. It's a brand new experience for him and these Auburn fans. They've had a really good run of football these past few years. Mm -hmm. National Championship 2010. National Championship appearance 2013. And they've upset Alabama four or five times. times. Really good run. This is a bit of a reset. So Auburn fans have somewhat been through this before. Mm-hmm. After they won the national championship in 2010 with Cam Newton, they went three and nine the very next year. So they know about ups and downs. This might be a few years of downs because their recruiting might be down for a little bit. Because, like I said, Brian Harson, no SEC connections, no Southern connections. He's a brand new fit to this whole thing. They might get very, really embarrassed by Alabama this first year, but Brian Harson was a good coach at Boise State. He kept them stable. He kept them as one of the best group of five programs. Give them time, see what happens. Bo Nix isn't a very trustworthy quarterback, but he has a lot of talent, could get better. They have a running back that you need to remember his name. Tank Bigsby. Yep. You like the name? Heard of it. 
He is. I'm not even gonna say he's a tank. I'm gonna be more original than that. Yeah. He's a problem. Mm-hmm. As a freshman, he rushed for like 800 something yards. He can catch it out of the backfield. He's like six foot, like 220 something, mm-hmm. but has speed and ex- ex- explosiveness. Right. He can make moves on the open field. He can block. He's almost complete, and he's only a sophomore. Mm-hmm. When he comes out, he could potentially be a first round back because he has that much talent. He's he's gonna carry a lot of what they do on offense this year. Yeah. So, yeah, Auburn might take a step back. They might be, they might be a five six win team, but they could surprise some people because they still have a good amount of talent. Next, Arkansas, a team that surprised a lot of people now last year. They brought in a new coach, freshened things up. Only went three and five, but it was the most positive three and five season I've seen. Mm-hmm. Brought in Felipe Franks from Florida. He played really well. Now he's on the Falcons roster. Didn't get drafted, but I think he could stick with them for a long time. Another name you should remember. Wide receiver. An absolute beast. He's 6'3", almost 230. Traylon Burks. He might be the best receiver in the SEC this year. And he should be one of the best in the country. He's 6'3", almost 230. But he can run. Like almost 4'4 speed. So you're telling me he's going to make those DBs be trailing? Listen, he can beat DBs off the line of scrimmage and beat them with speed. He can also beat them off the jump. He has a crazy vertical. He's just an athletic monster. Mm -hmm. Plus, he has the size, and he has really good hands. He's not a polished route runner, but it's not hard for him to get open because he's just so physically superior to most DBs. So, number 16, Traylon Burks, watch out for him. Arkansas might not win six games they might not get to a bowl but they 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 will be better than they were last year and they'll still progress as a program Mm -hmm. so arkansas taking steps under head coach sam Pittman, they should be back and also quarterback kj jefferson should be interesting too he's a run threat as well as a passing threat finish finishing up the sec east the cellar dwellers of college football vanderbilt since James Franklin left in the early 2010s, mm-hmm. things haven't been pretty. I think the most wins they've had in a season since he left was five at the most, and it's been down from there. They haven't had much talent. They haven't had much confidence. They haven't had much hope. And they're in a the ruthless conference. But now, with the realignment, I'm not going to say that. That's terrible. I don't want them to stay in the SEC. <laughs> with a brand-new coach, Clark Lee, he was the defensive coordinator at Notre Dame, former Vanderbilt football player in the early 2000s, and this was his dream job. He had Notre Dame as one of the best defenses in the country for a few years, decided to come home to Nashville, and he's already doing a really good job. First recruiting class he's putting together is already top 40, I believe, which is better than most Vandy recruiting classes in their history. His enthusiasm is great. He clearly, he has a plan, and he has a quarterback, which is most important. Mm -hmm. Young kid named Ken Seals started as a true freshman at Vandy last year. His stats were only like 10 touchdowns and like eight interceptions. But when you watch him, he was never afraid against any team he went up against in the SEC. He played smart. He played confident and tough. And he, he only took chances when he needed to. The talent around him isn't up to par yet, so that's where the interceptions came. When he took a chance and tried to go deep, he only has a few receivers that can really make plays. But Ken Seals, number eight for Vanderbilt, remember his name. In a few years, he will be on NFL radars, like Jay Cutler was when he came out of Vandy. Very talented kid. Clark Lee is redoing things at Vandy. The talent they brought in that are freshmen and sophomores are honestly more talented than the juniors and seniors. Mm -hmm. So it's a process that all Vandy fans need to watch out for. Vandy fans are excited already because of how things are looking and how much, how refreshed they look as a team and a coaching staff. So Vandy still won't be good, but the future could be somewhat bright for them. Right. And finishing up the West, uh, how did I skip over LSU? I was just going to ask that. Maybe I skipped over them because – they could be the surprise disappointment of this season, ladies and gentlemen. Mm. 
they had a quarterback battle going into this camp, but Miles Brennan got hurt, and Max Johnson, who was a true freshman last year, lefty Brad Johnson's son, former quarterback of the Tampa Bay Buccaneers, mm-hmm. young lefty, is going to be the starter for the LSU Tigers. Now, LSU, last year, things kind of fell apart. They put together a coaching staff that didn't make much sense. Bo Pelini was the defensive coordinator, and things went wrong very fast. Everybody was putting up points on them. They got upset by Missouri. Things weren't looking good. Mm -hmm. They finished the year upset in Florida under Max Johnson, and things started looking more positive. But they still are very young. Receivers, quarterback is just a sophomore. Running backs are talented but haven't proven much. And the defense is young too. The experience is good that they have, but it's a big question mark for LSU. First week they got UCLA at UCLA. That could be an upset, and they could be an eight-win team. They could also win 10 games because of talent, but they could be a seven- or eight-win team. And that would be crazy if LSU had another down season. Things would get very, very iffy for LSU if that happens. <laughs> Might have to reevaluate their head coach. Mm-hmm. And lastly in the SEC, Mississippi State. Coming back, last year they had first-year head coach, and his name just slipped my mind. Former Washington State head coach. Air Raid guy was at Texas Tech before that. (laughs) He's been known for entertainment almost more than product on the field, even though he builds up programs, gets them to the top, and as soon as they start falling off, he dips. There's a short moment of climbing up to the mountaintop, and then they instantly fall off, and he either gets fired or he leaves. Now he's in the SEC, and... Things started off well. They upset LSU. And then players started leaving and things got bad very quickly. Mm-hmm. This is pr- this is like a year zero part two for Mississippi State. Mike Leach. Mike Leach, ladies and gentlemen. Yes. Things are getting crazy outside. It's storming like crazy outside. <laughs> I know I keep looking off to the side, but it's like yeah. green clouds and Big storm going weather. on, it's and I left crazy. my jacket in my car, so I might be sitting here for a while. So, we'll, uh, yeah, we're a little distracted. But, yeah, Mississippi State. <laughs> Mike Leach. <laughs> Mike Leach. They have a true freshman quarterback that finished out the season pretty well. They brought in some transfers. The guys that left, they brought in guys to replace them. And they surprisingly had a very stout defense for a Mike Leach-led team. Good defense, building offense. They shouldn't be very good, but the Egg Bowl, which is Mississippi State versus Ole Miss, is always interesting. Lane Kiffin versus Mike Leach is worth the price of admission. Mm -hmm. It'll be a toss-up because there will be a lot of points. I'm assuming Ole Miss will win. But when Mike Leach is there, there's always a chance for an upset, and there's going to be excitement. So they won't be very good this year. They're also building. That was your SEC preview. Top three SEC teams. At the end of the season. Alabama, Georgia, and I am going to go Ole Miss. Okay. Surprise. I'm just going with the surprise just off the <laughs> head. Because they, they have so much talent, and I trust Lane Kiffin to have them ready to go every Saturday. Yeah. They could be a nine-win team because of their talent. Mm-hmm. All right, first college football preview done with. The big one, one of the big ones, out of the way. Next week, we'll see who we decide. All right, we only got about 10 minutes left, so we might just start this AFC North talk, and then we'll finish it next week. Um, But I want to start with the bottom of the barrel, getting into NFL previews, division by division. We're going to AFC North. Well, bottom of the barrel, maybe because you don't – no, like, I'm talking oh. in this division. I'm going to start oh, with oh, okay. in, yeah. the teams individually. No, this division is actually going to be really competitive, I think. Um, it usually always is. you got the Ravens and the Steelers, um, always with that little rivalry. The Browns are emerging. And then you got the Cincinnati Bengals, who they're the bottom of the barrel, but they're going to be fun to watch. So let's start with the Bengals. They got Joe Burrow coming back from injury. That's a big question mark there. 
Joe Mixon also coming back from injury. Big question mark there. Uh, and then they got this pretty crazy receiving core because they decided to go with Jamar Chase at the five overall. So they have Tyler Boyd in the slot, Jamar Chase, and T. Higgins on the outside. Uh, they're lacking a little bit at tight end. C.J. Uzma and uh, Drew Sample, they seem to kind of split. They're lacking at another position that they uh, the could have gone line. with in the first round, but the they offensive line. chose to go with in the second round. Uh, yeah. They're going a tough offensive line. They did sign Riley Reef to be their right tackle, which is solid. But, yeah, they have Jonah Williams on the left side. Uh, I guess that's rough, but – I mean, he's not bad, but their offensive line is just, it's going to struggle. And as fun as their offense could be, the offensive line may ruin that for them. Because if you look at their position players, they're pretty stacked with young talent. Like I said. Oh, man. Cut off. Oh, it's still going. Oh. <laughs> okay, so it, it might have... Lights just went down. Oh, We're recording boy. on the computer, but um, <laughs> wow. We might just have yeah. to redo this whole AFC North preview after might this. Might have to, yeah. Because this is kind of funny. Um, but like I said. Or we just keep it. <laughs> yeah, we. I mean, we're going to keep it going, but yeah. we can recap it next week. Yeah. Um, but yeah, their offense is, is what it is. And their defense is awful. So, I mean, in this division, there's not going to be able, anything they're going to be able to do. We're still recording, so it's fine. <laughs> but what people don't hear is that the lights and stuff are going off yes. in this room because we're not as uh, backed up in this room as the rest of the building. Their defense is going to struggle. And in this division, when you have defenses like the Ravens, the Steelers, and now the Browns, who have improved their defense each and every year, and I thought had a great, a great draft for their defense, <laughs> The Bengals are the bottom of the barrel of this division, as fun as they could be to watch at times. Um, so, yeah. Anything else you want to add to the uh, the Bengals? I am afraid for Joe Burrow's life. Mm. I hope they protect him. I have seen a few things that said he has been looking shaky in training camp, almost like he's still scarred from last year's hits. Yes. And that is not good. Uh, I, I've also... I saw a few clips of him throwing dimes also. Yeah. So there's probably been some inconsistency. I really hope they can protect him and don't mess this up. But they're Cincinnati, so. Yeah. And the other concern yeah. is that Jamar, Tra Jamar Chase has been struggling in training camp. I don't take too much into that. I think, uh, you know, it's getting acclimated. You People forget he took a year off. Yeah. So who knows what's going to happen from there. Um, but T. Higgins was a standout last year. I think they're going to be just fine in, in that aspect. It's just staying healthy, and yes, hopefully that offensive line can do somewhat of improving. Okay, want to transition to the team that I th I think you could correct me if you think I'm wrong. That's going to get third in this division. Who landed first last season? The Pittsburgh Steelers. Some people have them last in the division. Yeah, I think. Okay, now all of our lights just went out. <laughs> this is – oh, man. <laughs> uh, so, now it's getting crazy. It, it, the, cra the weather is insane out yes. here. I'm, we could change to a weather podcast, um, but I'm going to try to keep talking I mean, what, about do, what do you say besides it's, – <laughs> it's crazy out it's there. It's windy. It's yes. green, and it, there's a lot of rain. But, okay, so the Steelers, they had a really favorable schedule last year that I think helped them out a lot. And I haven't looked at their schedule this I mean, let me let me slide over to their schedule since we got a little time. They got Philly, Detroit, Carolina. Okay, they're gonna start with another <laughs> slam. Oh no, that's preseason. Okay. I'm looking at the wrong <laughs> spot. But okay, their schedule is still fairly easy. They got Buffalo as their first game. That's that's a tough one. Then they got Las Vegas, Cincinnati, Green Bay is a tough one. Denver is pretty easy. Seattle, Cleveland. Chicago, Detroit, Chargers, Cincinnati, Baltimore, Minnesota, Tennessee, Kansas City. Okay, the end of their schedule, again, gets very, very tough. And I think that's where a lot of their problems are going to lie. Um, we saw it last year. They struggled in tough games. They're the same way where they're, like, on paper, 
their defense is outstanding, obviously. Getting Minka Fitzpatrick last year was so good for them. They got TJ Watt, um, Devin Bush, just all these guys, Cameron Hayward. And then their offense, realistically, is also solid. Ben Roethlisberger, they're getting Najee Harris. He's kind of the intriguing one for this team now. But, like, their receiving core is stacked with Deontay Johnson, Juju Smith-Schuster, Chase Claypool. They got Eric Ebron coming back. They also, though, have some offensive line questions. Um, They lost a lot on the offensive line. They, I don't know. And they're in the same problem where, like, they need to be able to keep Roethlisberger healthy. And I'm not 100% sure on that. I believe they signed Trey Turner in this offseason. Yeah, from the Chargers. Which, I mean, he's he's pretty solid, but it's... I mean, they cut David DeCastro from his team, who yeah. is one of their best guards. They've reshuffled the O-line with a lot of guys I've never heard of. So. Yeah. And so we'll that's see kind of, how that works out. That's kind of the Steelers' big, biggest question mark, and that's why I think they're going to end up third in this division this season. Um as good as they were technically last year, I think it's going to be more of that struggling that we saw towards the end of the season. And again, this division is ruthless, especially now with the Browns being a good team. Yeah, I I think they're an eight or nine win team, honestly. The them never taking a successor for Ben Roethlisberger very seriously, yeah, is going to come back to bite them. Mm-hmm. Because they're, they're going to keep reeing him up on one-year deals over and over again until he eventually retires, and then what do they do? Yeah. Mason, Ru- Mason Rudolph isn't the future. Mm-hmm. Dwayne Haskins most likely is not the future. <laughs> yep. So I, I don't know if they just assume that the, like, their, their winning history will just continue no matter what, but, yeah, they, they have a good young receiving core. They drafted Najee Harris. They've reshuffled the O line. I don't know how good they'll be, mm-hmm. but they've reshuffled them, and they have solid pieces on defense. But yeah, I I don't I don't see Big Ben having another like incredible season. Yeah, unless he just surprises us again, which it's possible. Right. But, but even, again, it's going to come down to if we, their offensive line can keep him healthy. We saw how much they tailed off at the end of the season. Mm-hmm. So we we know what could happen and my, most likely what will happen yep. with Ben Roethlisberger in this offense. But at the same time, I will add one last thing. Their run game was awful last season. If Najee Harris can figure it out, and they're, I mean, again, it also stems off the offensive line, but if they can get a run game going, they'll be less predictable, and I think they'll be better. Okay, we only have a minute left, and one thing that we forgot to talk about, Dennis Schroeder. Yes. Signed to the Boston Celtics. Asked for $100 million. How much did he end up nowhere with? near it. He is on the mid-level exception. One year. I love it. 5.6. I love it. This guy is getting roasted on Twitter. He turned down $84 million from the Lakers because he thought he was worth $100 million. Never averaged 20 in a season. Mm-hmm. On a good team. Prototypical six man, basically. Yes. Uh, uh, one of the He's highest a high level six man. Honestly, one of the highest level six mans in the league. It's a high level six man. Doesn't mean you're worth a hundred million. Exactly. There are starters that we saw, like Evan Fournier, seventy eight million, and we thought that was an overpay. Not a hundred million. I never understood where he was trying to get it from. I know you want to try to get your your money. But at the same time, you got to be realistic. I don't know who messed it up. I don't know who dropped the bag here. If it was Dennis Schroeder himself, or, or it was agent. an agent. Yeah, who I, knows? There's some something that messed up. But guys getting roasted on Twitter. Honestly, I think it's really funny because you know he just thought he was going to get more, and he just doesn't know his worth. I guess didn't, didn't test out the market well enough. He thought he did. He definitely thought yeah. something. A large part of it is Dennis. Yeah. Alrighty, next week, like I said, we'll uh, go to the top teams of that AFC North, Baltimore and Cleveland. We'll do another college uh, division. We also do another NFL division one more time. We'll do less summer league talk. We had to kind of go over a lot of the summer league stuff. 
Um, so we're getting more and more into football. And, yeah, it's getting exciting. Hopefully the weather clears up. I'm getting nervous. We'll see you guys next time.